Hello, MSAT students. This is Dr. Cosby. Today, we're going to be talking about power, authority, influence, and leadership. I was going to separate the two, so I'm hoping this isn't too long of an online lecture, but really the four are interchangeable. Um, they are interwoven. They are so positively correlated that separating them would make it feel like they were distinct. So I'm putting them all into one online lecture. As you sit here and you listen to kind of this lecture on power authority, I call it PEL, power, authority, influence, and leadership. Um, you're probably wondering, one, how does this apply to the boards? And then two, I hope it's how does this apply to me as a professional? So one, we have several different things in the boards that will be um, asked of you as it relates to definitions that pertain to power, authority, influence and leadership. And then there are several scenarios that have been built around different types of interactions that you might experience. For example, a head athletic trainer in power over an assistant athletic trainer or an athletic trainer and a coach or an athletic trainer and a student athlete. You'll be asked to select the different types of power, the different types of leadership styles, et cetera. So it becomes important to prep for your boards. But I would even argue more important than that, as you leave this place and you begin to transition into practice, um, you're going to experience different power dynamics, head athletic trainer, assistant athletic trainer, head athletic trainer, coaches, student athletes, athletic trainers, um, athletic director, athletic trainer. So there's just so many different dynamics that you're going to experience that it becomes important to understand what it actually means to be uh, in a position of authority or power, um, what type of leadership style you're going to work best under to be able to identify that and know that because it's going to create a better work environment are all of the reasons that we have this class and that we really want to talk through those with you all. So we will do that in this online lecture and then we will dive way deep into clinical scenarios in our class. My favorite quote as it relates to leadership really is one around what it looks like to actually be in a leadership role and the best leaders that i've ever seen are leaders that are that allow their team to actually do the majority of the leading they train them in such a way that they're not concerned about their ability to be successful in any task that they give them right that's what it means when they say when it says i'm their leader i've got to follow them it means that a good leader can lead from the back of of the of the team and allow the team to pave the way right and, and we think about that concept of leadership it's so drastically different right because most of the time most leaders either want the credit for the success of the team right want the credit for the decrease um, in number of ankle sprains because their staff came up with a preventative exercise program but a true good leader would be one that can stand in the back in the background and really um clap it up when they hear great things about the things that their team is doing. The next term that we're going to talk about is power. We're going to define this later, but as we start talking about these concepts of power, authority, um, influence, and leadership, one of the things that is probably at the forefront of my mind as I'm doing this is power, because power is the capacity to translate intention into reality, but then also to sustain it, right? Let me say it to you another way. Power if used positively can incite change and then that change can be long lasting but if power is in the wrong hands right we've seen it impact communities we've seen it impact cultures we've seen it impact sports medicine clinics we've seen it impact medical facilities so we have to make sure that when a person is in power that they've earned the right to be there and that they have really good leadership styles in order to incite change and to really work with a team of individuals to kind of deliver the actual overall vision. So let's define the three three of the four terms, which are power, authority, influence. I'll define leadership on a different slide. These three are probably the most um, used terms as it relates to uh, concepts or areas of leadership. I'm gonna go across the row and then um, and, and then obviously down the column, but I'm gonna go row by row by row because I wanna compare the three and contrast the three at the same time. So power, as we define it, uh, it's all about control and, and directing others and doing that through force and coercion, right? We think about how that actually happens. Um, it could be physical strength, right? That would be force. It could be that they're placed in a position of power because of their wealth. It could be positional power, which is 
Um, it can be twofold. It can be, oh, I'm the heir to the throne. So I get placed in a position of power because I was already in position to do that. And then obviously it can be like the actual position, right? I'm a head athletic trainer. You're going to listen to what exactly what it is that I say, or you'll get fired and I'll hire someone else that can do it better, right? Authority, on the other hand, it's not something that's gained through physical strength, wealth, or position. Authority is actual official legal power um, that you're given to make orders, to, to make decisions, to enforce obedience among your, your work group. It's usually given by an organization or a society. So an example of that would be like majority vote, right, for presidential candidates or vice presidential candidates, etc. As you're getting ready to interview, most of you will sit with a search committee or yeah, a search committee, and that will be comprised of multiple people. And those individuals will then vote whether or not to bring you to campus. They will vote whether or not to actually hire you. That's a majority of votes. So that's given to, that's given by an organization or a society, right? And then we have influence. Influence is completely opposite authority and power, but does involve them in, in, in this regard. When you are an influential person, you have the capacity truly to impact the character, the development, the behavior of the people in your team. And that's most often earned. Does that make sense? It's not given, it's earned. It's not something that's voted on. It's earned or gained through your clinical skills, your expertise, if that makes sense, your personality or your charisma, and your ability to positively persuade people to do the things that you want them to do. Now, notice I said persuade and not coerce, right? Those are so different um, persuade is positive, right? Coercion is very negative most often or associated with negativity most often. And so as we move down this chart, uh, when we think about power, it's always and most often um, exercised forcefully or coercively. Um, and you always give orders using some type of force or some type of threat, right? Do this or you'll lose your job would be an example of that. Authority is usually uses the law to exercise decision making, right? Um, so an example of that would be, this is in your contract. You should be doing this. If you do not do this, then we will um, let you go. And then we have influence. Influence, it's exerted through the inspiration, through guidance, through social interactions, that charisma piece, through social interactions with people within your department, on your team. Now, as we think of longevity of positions, how long can a position be, uh, person be in position of power? How long can a person be in position of authority or influence, right? Um, we move from, on the left-hand side of this chart, power, which is very, most often very tempor temporary, because what happens, as we see in the bottom row, is it leads to resi resistance and resentment among the people that this leader is leading, right? They can only take so much coercion or force before they either, like, revolt against the actual person in power. Um, but sometimes it's long lasting if, for example, the person in power is in charge of a community that might be more passive in nature and not active, right? So then either another powerful leader comes and overtakes, right? And we see that a lot in, in history, um, for example. Authority is usually more stable and it depends. It can be short term or long lasting. It's going to depend on the legal contract, right? Presidency would be an example of that. It's a four-year contract, unless, of course, they they do things along the way to be impeached, right? But other than that, we know that we're going to have a president in place for four years. We know that most athletic training contracts are year to year, right? So you have a year to be considered for rehire. So that's why I say it's more stable, it's more enduring, which generally makes most of the team more accepting of your leadership, right? Because they know you're here for a year. We know that they know that you were voted in by majority vote. So you have that legal power to make decisions and to give orders. And then you have a group of individuals who say, this is the person that we're going to be working with. We want to support that particular person. Influence, on the other hand, as I said, exerted through inspiration, but it's long lasting. It isn't short term because you're changing character. You're you're developing people. You're pouring into them. Right. I hope someday that I'm influential, that I can continue to be an influencer of some of our students as they leave our program. It's long lasting. It's forever. In other words, even when you all graduate, the hope is that some of you will have these long lasting relationships with myself, with Dr. Nooks, with one of the adjuncts, with a staff member, with peers, for example. Um, and that is the diff the major difference between someone who's influential, someone who's in a power of authority, um, in a position of authority or and or power is that influence can change lives 
right? And that long lasting change can be permanent in that particular person. So let's talk through pros and cons as we look through each of these, because each of these, even though I'm making it seem like being influential is also positive, it can sometimes have its cons as well. And I'm making it seem like power is just also terrible, but it can also have its pros. So an example in the power category here, we can see that these individuals, they're going to, they're going to allow people in their team to make decisions and they're going to implement them effectively. Why is that? They're either being coerced or they're being forced. So you can make sure that a person in power, true power is going to get stuff done because the people are going to be so afraid that guess what they're going to do? They're going to do it. They don't want to lose their job. They don't want to lose their family. They don't want whatever it might be. They're going to do it. Um, it enables control over resources. So you have one person in control of the resources, which creates consistency in decision making. Some would argue that's a con in other different models. And then you're, you're, this person in power, true power, not legal power, will truly drive change because everyone working under them will, will be in fear. So they will work to help this leader drive change. On the con side of this, um, oftentimes we see that if a person has too much power, it can lead to an abuse of power and expectation exploitation of people, um, usually in the weaker culture, right, um, can create what we call as a hierarchical authoritative um, environment, which means you have the leader and then everyone else is just below that. There's no pyramid to this process. And so what we see, what I said already, is you at some point in time, the people build up a, a resentment and then they don't cooperate with the leader or they start to um, show a lack of cooperation for the leader in that particular kind of society or that particular um, that particular work group. Now, authority, when we're thinking about the pros, clear chain of command structure because it's it's legalized, right? You're going to know who the boss is. You're going to know who the managers are. You're going to know who the department chair is or the dean is, for example, the head athletic trainer and the assistant athletic trainer. Because there are rules governing this, then there's efficient decision making. It's very clear most often. And so because there's clarity in the hierarchical structure, because there's clarity in the decision making, because people aren't being coerced or forced to make decisions, then people feel more secure. The security also comes from the fact that there's this legal contract. And so this position is going, this person is going to be in the position for an extended period of time. Now, cons, what we see with authority is sometimes there's a rigidity or an inflexibility in the decision making process because there are rules. So you can't go outside of the legal kind of construct, right? Um, it can create a dependency on authority figures, especially if they've been in that position for a very long time. And then because the team members trust this individual so much, sometimes they lack autonomy or they lack the ability to empower themselves. So we can see pros and cons for both. On the influencer side, they, there's no formal position, right? Um, there's no authority. There's no given power. This is all earned and gained because people respect your skill set or respect your charisma or respect the way that you've interacted and treated them. And so one of the things that we see with um, influence is that it creates a collaborative environment where the entire all of the members of the team are able to kind of dream and be visionary. Um, and all of that is really holistic and healthy. Now, on the opposite of that, um, one of the things that we can see is a person with charisma, like a true person with charisma, it doesn't turn off. And so some people would say that if, they have, if there's too much charisma, um, that it, instead of being persuasive, oftentimes it can be manipulative. So this type of leadership style can also be seen as man manipulative in, in nature. And then one of the things with influence is it takes a longer time, right? Because you're developing people, you're changing behaviors. Those aren't short term things. So this model may take a little bit longer to enact over time. Now, I've been saying this word power, 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 more power. There are different types of power. The first is a positional power. And, and some of these definitions make perfect sense to me. Hopefully they make perfect sense to you. Positional power, I'm going to put my face over here, is power that comes from job titles, positions or roles, top down leadership. Head athletic trainer, they're in a position of power, right? They're the head athletic trainer. Assistant athletic trainer, you have your own type of positional power, but that positional power usually does not supersede that of the head athletic trainer. So we can see the top down leadership, head athletic trainer, assistant athletic trainer, usually athletic training student, and then student athletes, right? Or at the top top of sports medicine would be the athletic director, right? Or we can even go further, the physician. So we can see how positional power is positional power, and that's how we would define it. It's based on the 
the power you have based on the job title that you actually hold. Now, reward power is power to influence and drive performance through rewards and recognition. An example of this in healthcare, oftentimes, at least in the sports medicine clinic, is we want to reduce the cost, uh, the medical cost per year for student athletes being seen in our clinic. What does that mean? We want to refer out less, refer out less to PT, refer out less for surgery, refer out less for doctor's visits, etc. And if you do that over the year, then you will get a bonus on your next check. That would be an example. Um, for teaching, it's teaching evals, right? Sometimes we get teaching awards because our teaching evals are so great. In the field of athletic training, um, that might look, the reward might be, hey, if you keep my team healthy, um, the team will give you a bonus, right? So there's different ways to reward kind of success among a team, and that's called reward power. Now, my favorite power is expert power, right? To me, it's the most respected form of power. It represents leaders who have specialized skills. That will be you. People who have mastered skills, that will be you. I'm hoping that when you walk into the clinical setting, whatever clinical setting that might be, that you would have expert power, the ability to evaluate, assess, I'm not going to say diagnose, to create rehab programs, preventative programs, et cetera, and that people would respect you because you have a knowledge and a skill base that cannot be taken away. That's expert power. Referent power is power to influence others using your personality traits, interpersonal skills, integrity. Some of you, you're good at this, right? Like some of you have charisma. Some of you have the ability to walk in the room and everybody's paying attention to you because you're so outgoing, right? That's referent power. People respect you and give you power just because of the way that you've socially interacted with them. We know what coercive power is. It's one of the more negative forms, but in some places um, they would consider it positive, but it's power to make someone do something through threats and coercion. Some would call this manipulation power too. You don't want to live here very often, but if you have an insubordinate, let's say team member, this may be the only type of power that you can use to motivate them, right? And then last but not least is informational power. One of my favorites, I get geeked out and excited when I think about informational power. It's using research and data to drive decision-making, i.e. evidence-based practice, right? So everything you do within the organization is fact-based. Every decision that you make within the organization is all about the research. And that's called evidence-based practice or evidence-based medicine. So some of us have more of these power abilities than others. I think we need to figure out how we balance them, right? If you were to ask me what my top power probably is right now, I would say it's informational power and expert power, but I've certainly oftentimes used reward power or positional power when I'm forced to do those things. So which of these powers do you feel like are your strengths and wh which of these powers do you want to kind of develop as you move into a new role or you move out of the role of student and into the role of certified athletic trainer? Ask yourself that question. So I've been talking a lot about power, authority. I've been talking about influence. And then um, I've been saying this thing like leader, leadership. But what makes up a powerful, not just powerful, but successful leader? And there are five um, kind of traits that have been reported in the research literature. Number one, you're self-motivated. You're a go-getter. You're an initiative taker. Two, you're a creative thinker. You're a visionary, right? You see the you see the future. You dream where your, your clinic could go. You're influential, so you develop, you change behavior in patients or um, your staff. You inspire people to want to do better, and that change is long-lasting. You're adaptable and flexible, and then last but not least, every good leader is a team player, even when they don't want to be, right? So I can look at this list of five and go, I already know where I need to grow, and it's an adaptability. I am one of the most rigid people on earth. I like my things to be the same. I wake up at 6 30 every morning. Like I have a cup of coffee. Like my routine is very the same. I am very routine. Which of these five do you feel like would need to grow in you to be a successful leader in athletic training? That's a question. Um, it's a gut check really, right? To say, do I have these five or do I not? Some of y'all are not good initiative takers. You're not self-motivated, right? Some of you aren't creative thinkers. Add me to that category, right? Some of you are like me. You're not very adaptable. And some of you like to work by yourselves. You don't want to work as a member of a team. All of these are okay and no one's judging you. But these are the five traits of good, successful leaders when um, different organizations were pulled and, and, and when they thought of who the best leaders were, these are the five kind of traits that they felt um, made powerful, successful leaders. 
Now, why is this important in athletic training? I'm going to give it to you again because we're at 20 minutes into the lecture and I'm probably boring you and I'm not trying to, but um, we have this thing called the athletic trainers practice analysis. Um, and it, this is what it states and this is what the test is built off. And it's a longer document than this. I'm only pulling out a piece of this, but it states that in order to evaluate organizational, personal and stakeholder outcomes, the athletic trainer must have knowledge of, you ready? Leadership styles and theories, as well as they as well as demonstrate skills in providing leadership appropriate to situations and people. So we're doing this for this right here to prepare you for your boards, but then also to say that this is an expectation as you leave our program and work as a certified athletic trainer at some point in time. But more importantly, let's think holistically. If we as a program help you develop into a leader, you're already a leader or you're not maybe, or you will grow into that at some point in time. One of the things that we know about leadership and athletic training, the research is there to support this, is that your leadership ability at some point in time, the position that you hold in athletic training can certainly help athletic training become more competitive as a healthcare profession. The way that you lead, the way that you talk, the charisma that you have, the way you exert your power and your authority, the influence that you have, all of those things helps the field of athletic training get more respect from our healthcare community. And I'm still having conversations about what we do as athletic trainers. And part of this is about how, where are we in sectors of, of medicine? Where are we leading? Are we sitting on uh, committees to make it known that athletic trainers are just as, just as important and vital to the community of healthcare as a physician or a nurse practitioner? I'm just throwing it out there. Okay. All right. So when we think about leadership, um, whether we, I'm nerdy this way, um, read a few articles, and one of the things that was said is that when head athletic trainers were good leaders and other, they led their sports medicine staff, some of the things that we saw either in the physical therapy clinic or athletic training clinic, increases in patient satisfaction, decreases in patient mortality, increases in patient safety, I could go on and on, reduce medication errors, reduce complications from immobility, and the list will go on and on and on and on. But what am I saying? A good successful leader um, in the sports medicine sector can absolutely have an impact on patient outcomes. Or I'll say it a different way, a person who does not lead his, his or her sports medicine staff well, we can see poor patient outcomes. In other words, the patient is absolutely impacted by the type of leader you have right in your organization so as you leave us be thinking about that do you want to be a leader do you not want to be a leader what type of leader do you want to work for and how does that impact patient outcomes so let's talk leader versus leadership they are different i don't think i need to say that to you all but listen to me i'm gonna whisper it not all of you are going to be a leader and that's okay right so a leader is someone who has legitimate or positional power. So head athletic trainer, positional power, legitimate, more influential, right? Or it could be legal power, right? A leader is someone within an organization to whom other people are accountable. So to whom other people report, that's a leader. That may not be what you feel called to do and that's okay. But here's the thing, not everybody can be a leader because there's not enough room in organizations, but every single one of you can exhibit leadership behaviors right? Despite your rank, title, or ability. And I'll even throw in their pay. So let me go back to those leadership behaviors. Let me go back to those, right? Here we are. The five leadership behaviors that really, truly make someone successful. Self-motivation, creative thinkers, influential, adaptable, team orientation. As you start getting asked the question of what's your strengths, OMG, Am I not giving you like a interview jewel right now? You should be listing three of these easily, right? Okay, going back off my soapbox. So not all of us can be leaders because there's just not enough room in an organization for that. But certainly you all can exhibit some of the positive leadership qualities that I just um, mentioned. Now, I get excited because part of um, athletic training is um, exhibiting leadership qualities, but then also managing. Um, and those two, some people say they're the same. Some people say they're different. And some people say there are like there are like ways in which they share kinds of things. 
So athletic trainers can be leaders, but then they also are responsible for managing things, right? Managing tends to be a more formal role related to a title or position. Leadership, as we know, can be very informal and or formal. It just really depends, but it can be practiced regardless of the concept uh, of the, the context, right? You can always practice leadership styles no matter where you are, whether it's one on one conversations with your friend, group work, etc. So let's take a look at this athletic trainer job description, because I really like us to look at the responsibilities of an athletic trainer as it relates to leadership and management. All of these are going to require some type of leadership skill, right? Some, all of these are going to require us to manage patients, right? Assist in the day to day operations. Well, that requires some type of leadership skill, whether that's visionary, influential, motivation, right? Primary responsibilities will be, um, as an outreach athletic trainer to local high schools, influential, right? So we can see this is a small list. This is just one job description that was just posted, but you can see that it's going to require you to manage items and it's going to require you at some point in time to move into a leadership position. Leadership doesn't have to be permanent. Leadership doesn't have to be long lasting either. Leadership can be short term for the day. You could have a leadership role, right? Your head athletic trainer goes out of town for the week and you're in charge. Now you're in a leadership position, right? Okay. Let's talk leadership and management. There are three primary schools of thought. We're concerning the two terms. One, the two constructs are the same. Two, I think I said this, both constructs overlap to some degree. Three, both constructs are completely different. So you all make the decision. I'm going to show you um, a table in just a second. Um, but leadership and management both do this. They motivate people. They deal with people. Uh, they use different types of power, right? Referent power, positional power, coercive power, reward power, all of those powers. Um, and they have to set goals, right? But as we look at this table, there are drastic differences between a leader and a manager. And I've kind of highlighted probably the hallmark ones, the ones that really separate managers from leaders. And one of them is that a leader is proactive. They can see things coming and prevent them from happening. A manager is reactive. The fire starts and I'm putting the fire out. I can't see the fire before it actually begins, right? Leaders are uh, very visionary in nature, can dream and live and create, very creative. Um, so they're going to define the vision. They're going to create the vision and your managers are going to implement the vision, right? So some of you I'm speaking to and you're like, yeah, I'm a leader. Like, look at this checklist. Some of you are like, oh, I'm a manager. I'm telling you right now, I'm a manager. I literally live on the manager side of things. I am more reactive. I give me your vision. I can implement it for you if I, if you need to. I identify obstacles, right? Um, I would say, I, you could carry both traits, right? Or tendencies. In other words, like I love team accomplishments. So from that side, I am on the leader tendency side of things. But for the most part, I tend to fall on the manager side. So all that to say, ask yourself, which one of these are you? I like to think of the leader as a, a, a person who's more creative in nature, um, loves to dream and think about, uh, think about vision, has a holistic approach to uh, management. And I like to think of the manager uh, managers as the people who are the executors. So which one do you fall into? There are negatives and positives to both. Um, my boss would say like, he loves the fact that I'm a manager because he can give me any task and I'm going to get it done. So if you're a task oriented person, more than likely you're you you have more of the manager tendencies than than not. OK, let's talk leadership theories. Um, you have to know these for the boards. But then as I started to do the research on them, I it was very interesting to see how leadership theories over time have kind of changed. So it started with the classical model and, and I kind of still feel this way. Maybe I shouldn't, I don't know. Maybe I shouldn't be saying that out loud in our online lecture, but I mean, it wouldn't be Cosby if I didn't. I like to keep it real with you all. Um, the classical model is this concept that um, uh, in the 1970s, leaders were usually men or women who were a part of like a special group, by special group, a wealthy group, right? So those that um, were wealthy had lots of money and could buy their power. Right. And that was usually um, if we're quite honest, it was usually white males. Um, and then the other concept in the classical model is that leaders were born. They could not be made. So you were either born into leadership, like hierarchical leadership, or you were not and you could not be a leader. And that's a part of the classical model that I, I I'm trying to convince myself of. In other words, you everyone has tendencies, right? Everybody has these tendencies. And the question is, you either are born with this innate instinct to lead or you're not. And if you don't, 
do that, it's okay. So that's the classical model. And then some people probably said, well, that's not quite right. There are people who could be developed into leaders, right? And so we moved over to the transactional model of leadership between the 1970s and 1980s. I know, why do we need to know this? You do, it's like the history of the NATA. Um, most often demonstrated as a formal transaction between subordinate and su supervisor, right? So head athletic trainer and assistant athletic trainer. Um, transactional leadership is management, transactional behavior center on creating uh, a manageable environment and reducing chaos. So this is the hierarchical structure that most of us are used to. You have a boss, you have people below the boss, the people below the boss execute what is needed um, or asked of them. And as a result, that reduces chaos and it keeps everything manageable within the environment. This is pretty tr the true traditional model. We've segued since um, to either a visionary model of leadership or an organic model of leadership. And I'll define both of those. And um, you can kind of maybe guesstimate what, what we have here at Point Loma. The visionary model, um, I said, AKA the transformational model. I like that. I think I like that term a little bit more. Um, it is really about teamwork. It's really about the influence of the leader uh, being able to motivate the followers or what I would call are the team members, right? Um, and so there was a change in the term from subordinate in transactional model. Did you see that? You've got supervisor subordinate um, from subordinate to follower. And even then I would change it to just say members of a team. But remember, the leader's gonna follow the team anyway. So that term follower doesn't bother me too much. But in your visionary model, you have a leader who ha is capable of creating vision and then capable of allowing the teammates, the team or the managers, right, to kind of manage that vision. And then the last model is probably newest, um, and that's the organic model. Leadership is shared, which seems interesting to me. And so you have traditional hierarchical structure, right, like boss, either follower, subordinate, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. In this model, they're avoided. So I, it would be like me, the program director, telling all of my faculty, let's just share the program director um, role. And there is some research to suggest that your generation moving forward will appreciate this organic model because it's a group-based model. And many of you grew up working in groups and having group conversations and making decision as, decisions as groups. So that's the organic model. There's no true per se leader, everyone's a leader and everybody's voice is respected. And so the traditional three models, that visionary model, that transactional model, that classical model, there truly is a, a leader. But in that visionary model, um, the leader shares that vision and allows the team to actually kind of work through the vision and execute the vision. So those are the four theories of leadership. In terms of um, what are the implications of the leadership paradigms? Um, you know, here's what I would say if I could summarize this slide and I don't want to talk through quickly too, too quickly through it just because you have to process it. But what I would say is um, as we've transitioned from one leadership, um, one leadership theory to another, I, I think the best type of leadership involves all of the things or items that we just talked about. Um, some leaders are born, but and some leaders are made or they're developed into a leader, right? We've moved from the classical model in that we now see an equal number of women and um, male leaders um, in, in higher positions. That transactional model, it was a real great model to start with in that it created structure, right? But we don't really refer to our workers as subordinates. That sounds so negative and has, and has such a negative connotation. When we move into the visionary model where we can see like um, a influential leader leading a group of people, um, creating the vision and then trusting the team to actually execute that vision. And I would say what we're going to start to see, what you all are going to see as you move into work environments, as older people move out of the work environments and you all start to take over, is that leadership can be shared, which is the organic model. So all that to say... It really depends on the workplace. I don't think you can place one leadership style, one type of power, one type of authority, one type of influential individual, um, or one leadership theory and apply it to every single place. I think it really depends on the place that you actually work in finding the work environment um, and leadership style that will work best for the people that are in the actual culture or actually in 
the actual community. But interestingly enough, many head athletic trainers, program directors, myself, um, senior clinical directors ascribe to the classical or um, transactional model. I would say I fall into that transactional, transformational model for sure, and maybe even the visionary model, right? And then you all, the young professionals, you all take to the visionary um, organic ideals where you're sharing the load, you're sharing the leadership, you want to see it be successful. So there's more buy-in there. Okay, so learning to lead. Um, how do we become how do we become leaders and how do we learn to lead with grace? That's what I would say. There are three factors that can influence the development of leadership ability, personality, which seems to be consistent, your values or your morals, and then all of the leadership behaviors that we talked about, right? So self-motivation, visionary, et cetera. Leadership behaviors are typically called competencies, um, and those are characteristics that lead to success on a job task. So when you want to lead, you have to have a pretty good personality. You have to have a really good moral co um, compass, and then you have to exhibit, remember those five top leadership abilities. You have to exhibit that over time. Now, here's what I've learned. It's all about trial and error. When I first became a program director, I'm not even sure I'm a good one now. I still am learning. And what I would say is um, that sometimes failure can be your best teacher in, in leading. And don't get discouraged if you get thrusted into a leadership role and you have no idea what you're doing. Sometimes you're going to be the person who's thrusted into power and uses coercion, right? Sometimes you're going to be the person who's thrusted into authority and you're very influential and everything, every mistake that you make makes you a better leader. I would say any leader that I've ever known has made many mistakes and that has really uh, made them who they are and made them more sensitive to the members on, on their team. So I would say it's trial and error. Don't be afraid to fail. Fail is oh, failure is okay. And if you work in an organization where failure is not, then you probably need to be rethinking where you actually work. All of you are in formal education, right? Um, the classes, this class right here is designed to kind of talk through leadership, um, talk through leadership theories, styles, communication, etc. Eventually, I'm going to be preparing you for your interview. Some of you are already doing that. Um, but ultimately, we can only give you so much education. And then once you leave us and transition into practice, hopefully you take that formal education and you apply some of the things, maybe not all, but some of the things that you've actually learned in um, in our program. That said, I will say some of the best leaders I know don't have a formal education, right? They have experience. And so I would say it's formal education plus experience equals a good leader. Last but definitely not least is going to be observation of others, right? Um, I don't think I would be who I am if I had not observed uh, both leaders fail and leaders be successful and also develop relationships with leaders to learn kind of what it takes to be successful, what it takes to actually manage a team. So the ability to watch someone and do it later, or I would say watch someone do it wrong and do it better, um, let, it, uh, let it inspire you to be a better leader, but we should always be observing those people around you. As you're working in the clinical sites that you're at now, what is your preceptors are doing that you would never do in a million years? And how are you gonna change that in your clinical practice? And what things do you wanna take away from your clinical preceptors that have been so influential and inspirational? Okay, common leadership roles. Here we go, this will be fun, I think, I don't know. Okay, so leadership role is here. And then the description of that leadership role is there. I don't think I need to go through every description, but you have the figurehead who's involved in ceremony and ritual. So I, I mean, I'm going to call that like part of the party planning group. You have the spokesperson. Um, that's the person responsible for like internal and external reporting and answering questions. So you have a patient, a high profile injury, and you're going on the news, right? This is usually the charismatic person in the group. You have the negotiator, right? I don't think I need to tell you what that person's good at. He should have been a lawyer in his pre, pre in their previous career. You have the coach who, not traditional coach, but the, co the person who's capable of giving positive feedback and recognizing achievements within the team. You have the team builder. This is the person who's going to create collegiality within the group. So they're going to host parties, encourage morale, encourage you guys to hang out outside of the actual workforce. You have the team player, my favorite. This is the person who's going to do anything you ask them to do. They're, they have appropriate conduct. They're... Um, they always want to provide assistance. They're like the perfect employee. Doesn't happen. But if you get them, they're they're the ones you want on your team. You want a high number of team players on your team. 
Then you have a technical problem solver. This is the person who is an expert um, and can advise the highest and the lowest on ways to move forward in a professional organization. You have the entrepreneur. Newer, uh, um, they're going to be innovative. They're going to be visionary. They're going to be creative. They're going to be figuring out ways to make money or save money. And then you have the strategic planner. Um, you're, they're going to be the ones that um, want to carry out um, and out input, set vision and goal. So they're going to work really, really well with the uh, spokesperson. They're going to work really, really well with the team builder. They're going to work really, really well uh, with a figurehead. So the question is, what type of leadership role do you see yourself having in an organization, right? Me personally, I'm all about um, the team player, the team builder, and the technical problem solver. Like ask anyone, anyone will come to me and ask me for, they'll ask my advice on a problem that they have. And I take deep pride in that, right? But some of these other ones don't ask me to do. I don't necessarily want to host a party, not the introverted side of me, right? I'm not a visionary. I don't like strategic planning and I definitely don't like selling things. So I'm not an entrepreneur. So some of you are though. And as you, as you leave us kind of recognize those strengths and as you, as the person is asking you, what are your strengths? You can say, I'm a negotiator. I am an entrepreneur. I am a strategic planner. Use key leadership terms that can help you seal a job position. Okay. There are types of leadership styles. Um, we've talked through leadership theories. We talked through power styles. Last but not least are gonna be types of leadership styles. I'll move my face out of the way so you can actually see that. So types of leadership styles, situational and transformational, not to be confused with the actual, um, what was it? The uh, types of leadership, I'm gonna go back so I don't say it wrong, not to be confused with the types of leadership theories, okay? So these are actual leadership styles, the two that we're going to talk about, situational and transformational. So situational changes his or her behavior based on the follower's response and action. What's that mean? Define situational. I'm going to change my leadership style based on the group of people that I have. This person is extremely flexible, right? Different situations and different um, employees require different leadership. Would you agree? Yes, absolutely, 100%. So this person, this type of leader is capable of recognizing who they have and really truly meeting them right where they are versus expecting them to do something that they might not actually be able to do. And so um, in terms of motivation and, and skill ability of the subordinate, they are able to place their subordinates, right, or their followers in positions of success because they're able to recognize what they're capable of. Now, we have these things called directive behaviors and supportive behaviors. So the directive behaviors of this particular leadership style or the ways in which the leader will directly interact and engage with their followers is by giving directions, by establishing goals that the, the follower or subordinate can actually reach, by defining clear roles, which becomes important, and then providing evalu ongoing evaluation for the people or the members of their team, right? The supportive behaviors, the things that the leader will do to support the team is allow for two-way conversation and communication to provide emotional and social support, to always be asking for input. So you can see that this situational leadership is more influential in nature. Are you all seeing that a little bit? Okay, then we have transformational leadership. Um, recognize and, and exploit the needs of, of their followers um, with uh, uh, with with transformational leadership, um, this leader typically has more charisma. They're going to look for potential motives in followers, seek to satisfy followers' higher needs, and engage um, the full person. They can usually try to convert. That's where the transformational leadership comes from. Um, followers, so those below them, into leaders and make leaders into what I call our moral agents, someone who takes personal responsibilities for action, commitments, and is genuinely committed to the followers' fundamental wants, needs, aspirations, and values, and tends to be results-oriented. So you have two different types of leadership styles, both of which work relatively well. Your situational leadership is probably my favorite because I don't think any organization, I'll say it this way, can thrive unless it really truly recognizes the needs um, and the strengths of their actual employees but yeah, I love this transformational leadership because it's a leader who is really going to try to convert 
um, its followers or its team members into leaders. And that can be deleterious, right? Because if you have people who don't want to be leaders, then you may spend time developing people who don't want to move into leadership uh, positions. All that to say, the situational leadership tends to be a little bit more flexible and a little bit more ideal for most patients or patients, most people working within that particular uh, corporation. So this last thing, um, I promise you, is what is called emotional intelligence. Yikes. Um, anytime you're in a leadership position, critical leadership behavior that includes, here's the thing for leaders, it includes awareness of self, right? And others and the ability to handle emotions and relationships. So let me say it another way. You have to be able to provide social emotional support for your, your team members. Some of us are empathetic and sympathetic and can do that easily, shoulder to cry on. Then there are leaders that have to develop this part, right? The ability to look at someone and who may be in an emotional crisis and say, how can I help you, right? Defined as the ability to understand and manage people to act wisely in human relations. What's that mean? It means we have to consider the whole person when we make decisions and in, in a leadership role, right? And this, the emotional intelligence is most often associated with highly developed, transformational, I'm gonna add a word, influential leaders. I am done with our lecture. Um, I think what I want wanted to do with this, I think my goal was to give you the definitions and then to be inspiring you all to be thinking about, are you a leader? Are you a manager? Or do you just have leadership qualities that might benefit you, benefit the place that you're going? Two, what strengths do you exhibit that would tell another program, medical company, corporation, that they actually want you, right? As you prepare to leave Point Loma, oh my gosh, I, I'm, I'm getting sad thinking about it. But as you prepare to leave Point Loma, um, I hope that this place has influenced you. I hope that this place has impacted you in some way such that you would want that long lasting relationship with, with our institution. And then more importantly, my prayer is that as you leave this place, that you would want to be influencers. Um, influencers of your patients' lives, influencers of um, the staff that you're going to work with, right? Um, influencers of behavior. Um, so we are done with our power, our authority, our influence, and our leadership um, lecture. I hope that some of this resonated with you. I can't wait to kind of have discussions on this particular topic in class. Thank you for listening.